is, is brought by Mr. Bill Newman, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So Thank I'll turn you. it over to you, Mr. Bill. Thank you. I am not the agent for our speaker today, but her books are available on Amazon because that's where this one came from, and uh, I, I loaned it out, so I haven't got to read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. So if you want to know more about Rosenwald Schools after today, just go on Amazon or I'll let you borrow this one. But I think most of the people in here can read, and uh, the introduction is actually, you know, in your program. So the first thing is, how do you say her last name? So I'm going to help y'all. Hoff Shwelli. Correct? Okay, so it's Dr. Mary Hofschwelli. And um, here's the big points. Born in Billings, Montana. Raised in Pittsburgh. Then she went to Chatham College there in Pittsburgh. Then she went to, I'm going to ask Eugene this one. Uh, okay, you saw in there that she went to the College of William and Mary. In chronological order, if Harvard is the oldest college in America, where does it fall in in chronological era between 1 and 10? It's, I'll tell you, it's in the top 10, but the College of William and Mary. I like stumping Eugene. I've never done it before, so. Well, my guess would, it be, would be that it was the second. He's correct. I've still yeah. failed. Never stumped the man. Okay. At Wren Hall. Uh, I think this is actually in tavern. Okay. All righty. Well, so then she got her master's in a tavern. Okay. She got her master's from the College of William and Mary. And he's right. <laughs> Yeah. For a, a UT and Auburn graduate, it doesn't mean a lot. But And then she got her doctorate from Vanderbilt, so some pretty prestigious schools, and she's written a bunch of books, this being one. And I'm not going to take up any more of her time, but uh, I'm anxious to learn and hear more about the Rosenwald schools in the South and in Tennessee. So, Dr. Hofschwelli. And this works undone? Thank you, and thank you so very much for arranging the uh, audio visuals for my presentation today. And thank you very much, Amenu, for the invitation to be here with you today. Um, and, and I'm delighted to have a fellow Phi Beta Kappa member. I used to give tours of the Raleigh Tavern, and that's one of the things we talk about in, in the main dining room there when I was at Colonial Williamsburg um, as part of my graduate program. So. Uh, I'm very excited to come and speak about Rosenwald Schools. I have been living uh, and breathing Rosenwald Schools for about 25 years now since I was working on my PhD at Vanderbilt University. And uh, it finally led to the publication of my book, but more importantly, it has been an opportunity to engage with people in communities all across the South. And it's just been a wonderful and actually a transformative experience for me. And I think it's appropriate to be speaking to Rotary today. I was thinking about this looking at your website and the four-way test um, and issues of fairness and of goodwill, uh, I think you'll see that that is very much what the Rosenwald School program was all about. So, the next uh, slide that we'll see um, shows a map of the locations of all of the 5,000 plus Rosenwald buildings, just under 5,000 schools and then uh, several hundred teachers' homes and vocational buildings constructed in 15 different states using matching grants uh, along with public funding for the construction of modern school buildings for African-American children. 
and these were all public schools constructed, as you can see at the top there, uh, between 1912 and 1932. But I want to say a little bit more about sort of the, the way that the Rosenwald program fits into the, a, a longer, much longer history, stretching back really to the years right after the end of the Civil War. Uh, when African Americans, whether they had been free prior to uh, uh, the emancipation or had been enslaved, uh, made education one of their top priorities in the post-war period. And throughout southern communities, you would have found schools being held in buildings like this. This is the Pikeville Chapel AME Zion Church um, in Pikeville in Bledsoe County. It was the location of the first public school for African Americans in uh, uh, Pikeville. And the Lincoln School was operated in this church building for many years. And in other communities, you would have found African-American schools being held not just in churches, but also in fraternal lodge buildings, cast off buildings that had been donated by farmers, uh, people with some property or buildings that were cast offs from the uh, white school system. Uh, so this was really the beginnings, the roots of what would become the Rosenwald School movement. In fact, the, in this case, the second Lincoln School is a Rosenwald School building constructed in 1925 as a freestanding building. So here you saw a real public school, not a public school, for, but that was actually held in a private building and built according to one of the plans distributed by the Julius Rosenwald Fund. Now, the Lincoln School has, has an interesting history. We'll come back uh, to see more of it later, but it's okay. I was like, his is not like mine. He's <laughs> <laughs> not moving. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Today, if you go to see, the Lincoln School has been restored as part of a preservation movement that has been going on across the 15 different states that were involved with Rosenwald Schools, um, that has involved uh, state historic preservation offices, as well as the National Park Service, the and groups like the Tennessee Historical Com Commission, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, which has designated Rosenwald Schools as national treasures. Um, but really, to me, uh, Rosenwald schools are not only about architecture, although that's a very fascinating story in itself. They're really about people and people in communities. So I want to talk a, a little bit more about some of them. Uh, how is it that uh, people came to feel there was a need for something like a Rosenwald school building program? Well, our 1870 constitution, which uh, is actually the state constitution we still are governed by, much amended, but uh, we have one of the oldest state constitutions in the country. It carried forth a section from the 1835 state constitution in which we said that the state had a responsibility to provide uh, opportunities for education in order to build an educated citizenry. Um, after the end of the Civil War, state law and then our state constitution was changed to enact the first truly universal public school system in the state of Tennessee. That was a remarkable achievement. But right from the get-go, it was a segregated school system, initially by law, and then it was written into our state constitution. And what this meant is that the school funds were distributed uh, by the state on the basis of per capita enrollment so the number of children you actually had, how that money was spent was totally up to local school boards, and most of the money went into funding white schools and very little into African American schools. And so you ended up in, uh, with situations like the one you see here over in Murray County, where the Sandy Hook School by the early 20th century was really nothing more than the shell of a building and yet was still in use as a public school. 
So this is endemic throughout the South, and the people who started to uh, try to organize a, a major movement about it um, all were at Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University. Of course, uh, Tuskegee led by the famous Booker T. Washington, the Wizard of Tuskegee, um, famous book, Up From Slavery. Um, he had a model of self-help, but he uh, also did not think that that meant that you didn't acknowledge public responsibility. So uh, Booker T. Washington used Tuskegee to develop an outreach program in communities. The gentleman you see to Washington's right is Clinton Calloway, who was from Cleveland, Tennessee, originally. Uh, and he was uh, Tuskegee's outreach person, uh, their community organizer. He worked with communities in Macon County and other counties around Tuskegee, trying to build up efforts to improve conditions there. Another important person at Tuskegee was Robert R. Taylor, Taylor Sr., the gentleman in the center uh, bottom. He was the first black graduate of MIT, and he was the head of the building industries at Tuskegee. Um, so if you'll go ahead, thank you. So they, what they looked at were situations like this. We saw a Tennessee situation here is a, uh, a, a school in Macon County where Tuskegee is located. And they're saying, what, what can we be doing about this? So uh, Washington had Robert Taylor make uh, uh, building designs, which then Clinton Calloway worked with communities to raise funds for so that they could encourage their local school boards to build new schools. And here are some of the results. This is from a 1914 study of Macon County Schools showing some of the buildings that Tuskegee had been working with communities to have built as uh, public schools and then an interior showing them engaged in vocational education, which of course was a big initiative of Tuskegee's. So this was already going on uh, at, in Tuskegee and around Tuskegee. And uh, Booker T. Washington, though, was a great fundraiser, one of the greatest of all time, I think, and he reached out to anybody who had an interest in projects like his, including Anna Jeans, who was from Philadelphia, a Philadelphia Quaker who bequeathed most of her personal estate to create the Jeans Fund, which was dedicated to the improvement of rural schools for African Americans. A lot of her uh, money funded the hiring of what were called industrial supervising teachers. These were all African American, mostly female teachers who were itinerants. They went from school to school in a county um, working with teachers and with parents as well as students on school improvement, community improvement projects. So Booker T. Washington got and used Jeans Fund money to start building schools as well. But uh, by 1911, 1912, uh, he was looking for a, a bigger funder and he found that person in Julius Rosenwald. Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington became close personal friends uh, as well as uh, partners at Tuskegee. Uh, Rosenwald was invited to be on the board of trustees because of his stature as the president of Sears Roebuck. Uh, and he is the one who turned what was already a successful but a little bit haphazard organization into a major corporation. Um, tremendous business intellect that this man had. Uh, but he had reached the point in his life where he was very successful and he, as part of his Jewish faith, he believed he had an obligation to give back and to give to others. So he was, has, was interested in various, various Jewish causes, but he also became interested in the state of African American education in the South and was glad to join uh, the trustees at Tuskegee. And once he did that, then Booker T. Washington immediately said, and you know what, we have this great project going on and wouldn't you like to fund it? Uh, so, uh, and, and Roosevelt knew why he was there to, to help to fund that sort of thing. So the, uh, the two of them developed the initial plan for the Rosenwald School program. And here are things where you'll see the fairness uh, issue coming up as well as the goodwill issue. Their goal was to support construction of purpose-built, modern, I should say just decent schools uh, that were public schools for black school children. They wanted those schools to provide vocational, their term for it was industrial, but it, it included agriculture. Um, and they wanted to do that, but also provide academic instruction. 
the idea here of fairness comes in with their concept of leveraging money. They did not want to substitute private philanthropy or self-help for a public commitment. What they wanted to do was to set up a matching grant program where Rosenwald would offer a certain amount of money, local African Americans would have to match that money, anyone else could donate it as well, and then they would use those donations and grants to go to a school board and say, okay, now, please, uh, sort of fund the rest of the school building that we need and that um, we have needed for so long. And really their goal was to achieve fairness, equity. Um, they were saying, if you say separate and equal, then let's not just make it separate, let's make it truly separate and equal. So equity, fairness. But the ultimate goal was to produce a stronger communities, to improve conditions for black communities, certainly, but also to build interracial goodwill by requiring people to work through their local governments and their state governments and for people to have to cooperate to work together. Uh, so they start with a pilot program, uh, not surprisingly, just right where they're located in Macon County and nearby Lee County. They started this off with a small grant from Julius Rosenwald. Uh, they also orchestrated it with the man in the middle there. We've already met Clinton Calloway and Robert Taylor. Now they're working with Alabama's state agent for Negro schools, James Sibley. And the idea was, again, to make sure that these were public schools and that there would be a uh, state and local level buy-in. And they started to organize the first six Rosenwald schools. This led to the publication of a book of uh, building designs, the designs done by Robert R. Taylor and then published as a book called The Negro Rural School and its relation to the community. A slightly different version of this book was actually published as a set of Alabama state school plans. And we'll see this idea repeated later of making the, the official plans for schools uh, very similar between white and black schools. And there are a few of these early schools still standing all in Tennessee and in other parts of the South. So they had everything from a one-teacher school, which is you know, your classic uh, little red schoolhouse, to uh, much larger school buildings. The, currently, we think that the Bemis School in Madison County is the oldest standing Rosenwald School. It was constructed in 1916. Uh, as a partnership between uh, Madison County and then the Bemis Brothers Bag Company, uh, that, that model company town they had there. And it ha is currently undergoing restoration. So I said, they have to work through state agents. So um, having done this successful pilot project in Alabama, they opened this uh, program up to other southern states and that brings us to Tennessee. And the person that they work through here is Samuel L. Smith who was our state agent for Negro schools, originally from Montgomery County. And so as soon as he took this job in 1914, he's asking to get involved in the Rosenwald School Building Program. Uh, so if you wanted a Rosenwald School, whether you're a community member or as in this case, uh, we, we see you, uh, he's going to be reporting in this letter about his, how he's been approached by Charles Williams. She was the superintendent of schools in Shelby County. She wanted 12 Rosenwald schools in, in Shelby County right away. And so Samuel L. Smith has to write to Clinton Calloway at Tuskegee saying, hey, we went into this program and these are the, the schools we want where we would like to have them. And in fact, here is a picture where Samuel Smith and Cheryl Williams met uh, in Shelby County at the training school at Woodstock. Uh, where a shop building was under construction at that time. Shelby County had more Rosenwald schools than any other county in the state of Tennessee. Uh, this is a, another early Rosenwald school. It is the first one designed by Samuel L. Smith himself, the Fayette County Training School. And uh, this is important because uh, Samuel Smith had studied schoolhouse architecture uh, at George Peabody College for Teachers in Nashville. And that's what got him the attention of Julius Rosenwald. So in 1919, Julius Rosenwald uh, decided that he wanted to figure out what was happening with Rosenwald schools. He uh, had Fletcher Dressler, 
who was Samuel Smith's professor at George Peabody College for Teachers, do a study of existing Rosenwald School buildings. Um, Dressler didn't like them very much, but if you read his works, he didn't like anything very much at all. <laughs> he could just criticize everybody. Uh, so not surprisingly, he criticized those schools. But Rosenwald was reevaluating his own philanthropy. He had set up his own foundation, the Julius Rosenwald Fund, and he decided that he wanted to bring his school building program under his own personal foundation. So he moved the program out of Tuskegee and created a headquarters in Nashville. This is more of uh, what uh, Dressler was complaining about, that you know, this school had, was all wrong, had stilts, single floors. And what he wanted instead was to have this separate office, a southern headquarters in Nashville uh, where they, then the Julius Rosenwald Fund would actually oversee the operations of its building program. So they hired Samuel L. Smith to run the Southern office from Nashville because of his success and the fact that he knew building design. And uh, then Smith would stay with the program until its conclusion in 1932. What, one of the first things Smith did was to issue a new set of building plans. These were plans that the Julius Rosenwald Fund published as community school plans in 1920. Um, Smith's same plans, they were also published that year by the state of Tennessee as official Tennessee school building plans. So uh, there's a remarkable similarity between many schools constructed for both whites and blacks in this era of segregation. Smith then worked with state agents for Negro schools from across the South, um, and they met annually to sort of monitor the progress of Rosenwald School construction. Uh, Rosen, these, uh, uh, Rosen, excuse me, state agents for Negro schools, they were responsible for all black public education from grade one through uh, higher education. So uh, they really had uh, mammoth responsibilities. And recognizing this, the Rosenwald Fund realized that they had lost something when they um, dropped having someone like Clinton Calloway running this. They, they needed people out in communities. And so the Rosenwald Fund provided grants to state departments of education to hire African American men as Rosenwald building agents. These men were often the first black men to work in state departments of education since the end of Reconstruction. And they often held university positions in conjunction with their work in a state department of education. So in Tennessee, we had several different uh, building agents over the course of the Rosenwald program. Uh, this is an excerpt of, of a report from one of our Tennessee state uh, Rosenwald agents. And I don't know if you can see this, but uh, he visited Lincoln County March 10th and 11th of March 1921, uh, 20, excuse me. He said he visited Linville and Petersburg, the former ready to build and the latter has funds on hand, epidemic of influenza and inability to secure lumber is claimed to have held the work back. So these agents are out working with communities. They're monitoring local fundraising campaigns. They're the ones who go meet with your county board of education. And in this case, it's not surprising that in 1920, they're still dealing with the lingering effects of World War I and the, the massive influenza epidemic. This really, they're tied up Rosenwald schools quite a bit. Our longtime Rosenwald uh, agent, though, was Robert E. Clay, and uh, TSU has a building named for him. Robert Clay uh, continued to work for the State Department of Education long after his time at focusing on Rosenwald schools. And he was the one then who organized not just meetings uh, like Smith did of state agents for Negro schools, but meetings of Jean's teachers and school principals uh, at Tennessee A&I so that they too could be involved in local campaigns. And here uh, is another outreach effort, though. Uh, also, people like Samuel Smith and Robert E. Clay were interested in interracial goodwill. They didn't do this just through Rosenwald schools, but by being members of groups like the Interracial League of uh, Tennessee, which was part of the Commission on Interracial Cooperation in the South. 
So you may, maybe you can't see all these figures, as it would be hard to, but uh, these are the totals for uh, all Rosenwald schools. So Tennessee had 354 schools, nine teachers' homes, uh, 10 shops. Um, we had a total pupil capacity of almost 45,000 students. Uh, the funding is what's interesting and reflective of what you see for Rosenwald schools in general. African American Tennesseans contributed just over $296,000. Uh, white donations, uh, just a little over $28,000. Uh, and then Rosenwald matching grants of $291,250. But the biggest uh, funder of Rosenwald schools, as intended, were local and state school funds, $1,354,000 plus dollars. And again, that was the idea to use this matching grant program as leverage. So there's, a, I don't know very much about Lincoln County Schools. That's why I'm so excited people are here who went to the, these schools. Um, the uh, archives at Fisk University hold the records of the Julius Rosenwald Fund. And their files for Rosenwald Schools in Lincoln County are pretty uh, sparse. They don't have much in the way of photo documentation. But um, here we see some of the early schools, uh, one at Boones Hill and the other at Howell. Um, both of these schools were built, as they say, under Tuskegee, so I'm not sure what year exactly. And they show in the early years here the, the way that the funding was much more equal between all of the various sources. So, and what's interesting to me too is that here in Lincoln County, you had uh, really um, a sort of major, for the times, white involvement in terms of donations. So um, since we have somebody from Howe, African Americans contributed $350, whites $100, Rosenwald $150, and then the public funds $350 to build a one teacher school for a total cost of $950. Uh, the McDonald School, very similar, but uh, sort of a three-way split between African Americans, uh, the local school board, and the Rosenwald uh, program. But then you move ahead to the Lincoln School, constructed in the 1931-32 school year, and here you see the, the, the total outcome in terms of leveraging. The funding balance has changed quite a bit. This is a large eight-teacher school, so the Rosenwald Fund put in $2,600, um, African Americans $1,700, and then Lincoln County Schools put in $14,691. But again, uh, what's sort of interesting is to connect people, communities with this. So I wanted to revisit uh, B.M. Young's report for March 1920. He went to Linville and to Petersburg. So. And this is the Petersburg School. And, and you know, the Rosenwald Fund gave its names to schools. That's not always what they were called uh, when you came into a community. But here's the Petersburg School as it was constructed, shown in 1920-21. So what's so special about these schools? Um, I think that's always a legitimate question because there are so many historic schools and we should be concerned about preserving all of their histories. Well, there's the architectural element and Rosenwald schools were famous in their time for their attention to modern standards, lighting, uh, of course, they don't have electricity in a lot of rural communities, and they wouldn't have been able to afford it in most uh, black rural communities if it was available. So the use of natural lighting, always making sure that it fell from left to right over the student's shoulders. Uh, the interest in ventilation, so that uh, you would have proper airflow for a better student health. Sanitation as well. You couldn't build a Rosenwald school unless you also built an outhouse. And then instructional design. They're always, or not just a classroom, but they always had to have uh, separate cloakrooms, a teacher space, and a library as well. What I think is also important about Rosenwald schools is the way that their appearance on the landscape helped to undermine the, the whole segregation uh, system itself. 
um, instead of hiding black children away in churches or lodge buildings or just uh, consigning them to cast off buildings, instead here was a purpose-built school on a road if in plain view, a real statement of pride and one that was then a commensurate, maybe not uh, as had all the bells and whistles, right? this is still the era of Jim Crow, but was certainly much closer to what you would see for a white school. So as I said earlier, uh, state plans were important as well. The Julius Rosenwald Fund did not require you to use one of their plans to build a Rosenwald school. You just had to have a modern plan. So sometimes communities would build a school and it would follow a regular state mandated plan. This is what the Darwin School in Dayton, Tennessee. I think it's been recently torn down. It was not built on a Rosenwald plan like the school we saw before. It was built on an official state of Tennessee plan. But a plan that was very similar in appearance to what you would see for some larger Rosenwald schools. And Another interesting feature of Rosenwald schools is that their own building designs were never copyrighted. The Rosenwald Fund would send you school plans free of charge. No questions asked, just write to them, they'd send you a set of plans. So we all know school boards are cheap, right? They don't have a lot of money to spend. They don't like to hire architects if they don't have to. And here's somebody offering you free school plans, great. So uh, there are also white schools built according to community school plans got, that they obtained from the Julius Rosenwald Fund. The Lincoln School that we saw from Pikeville actually has a twin white school constructed exactly the same year. You cannot tell them apart inside or out. Uh, the Brush Creek School in DeKalb County was built using a Rosenwald plan. It's strictly for a whites only. So we have this, uh, this undermining. But I also think it's important to think about tradition, uh, the way that Rosenwald schools are part of a long history that stretches back, as in Pikeville, to the Lincoln School. And then you can bring that tradition forward. It, they are symbols from the get-go of community pride, community identity, and also an assertion of a right to a public education for all school children. So today on the landscape, we sometimes see buildings that aren't Rosenwald schools, but they're meant to invoke that legacy. Uh, in Smyrna, when they decided to build uh, a community center at a new public park, they actually named it after the white and black schools that were closest to this location. So it's now known as the Hilltop Rosenwald Park in Smyrna, Tennessee, uh, to recall the Smyrna Rosenwald School as well as the white Hilltop School that were nearby. And we sometimes have very modern buildings, like uh, as in Trenton, you know, their Rosenwald School long gone, but this modern building still has Rosenwald as part of its name. And Rosenwald schools remain uh, certainly community centers. They're often used as that purpose, uh, just as they were in the past. And so I, I think that's very appropriate that the people who built those schools, who went to school in those buildings, who worked across all sorts of barriers to engage other people in their community, still bring everybody back together in those schools today. So thank you very much for having me come to talk about a subject that, that I love and I be, would be eager to hear more that you know about Lincoln County's Rosenwald Schools. Thank you. Any questions? And thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> um, for your memory, hopefully it'll find thank a you. place on thank your you. yes. desk or somewhere yes, it for will. pencils yes, or you. coffee. But thank you. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us today. Oh, well, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.